This is Spare Time Repair and this is a pair of Sony mini disc recorders. The one at the bottom was purchased in the UK and as I discovered in a recent video it won't work here in the US without a step down power transformer. I've since decided that I don't want to use a transformer so I went on eBay to see if I could find a reasonably priced alternative that was native to North America. Of course reasonably priced meant that I was looking at units in need of repair and I discovered this one with a description that said it may have drive issues. Well, when we plug it in... We can hear that it very much has drive issues. But these Sony models are notorious for drive problems, so I thought there was a good chance I'd be able to repair it. But my preference is still to use my original machine as it's a more fully featured model. This is the MDS JE510, while this is the JE320 and you can see that it has fewer buttons and is generally a more stripped down version. So I've got a few options here. I could just repair the drive in the 320 and use that machine or if I can't fix the drive I can use the one from my old machine which should be identical. Or ideally I can take the transformer out of the 320 and use it to convert my 510 for use with a 120 volt supply. That way I get the best of both worlds but I don't know for sure whether that's going to be possible. I'm guessing that the motherboards for these machines will be almost identical, but I won't know until I can see them side by side. Firstly though, I would like to see if I can repair the drive mechanism in the 320, because I'd always rather repair a part than swap it out. So we're now looking inside the JE320, which is the replacement machine with a noisy drive. Oh, straight away I've noticed that the board is labelled as the JE510. I mean it's not, this is the 320, but clearly they use the same board and just populate it with more components. So that's a good sign. I'm going to open up the other machine and do a comparison. Right, so on the left here is the JE510 and there are some noticeable differences. The one that struck me first is that the drive mechanisms are not identical. They may still be interchangeable but the actual design of it is different. This one here has got a slot here, whereas this one doesn't. So that's a bit of a surprise. The version number of the boards is slightly different. So this one is 16650522, and this is 16650512. But they look pretty similar. This one just has fewer components on it, as you would expect. And the JE510 also has more connections on the back. We've got a mains power switch which is missing from here and we've also got optical in and out whereas this one only has an optical in. So because of these missing components and chips I'm not going to be able to just do a swap on the boards but hopefully I can still switch out the transformers. But really I'm getting ahead of myself because my first task is to see if I can fix this faulty drive. So you've got four screws holding it down and a couple of flat flex cables and hopefully yeah it just lifts out. I'm going to speed through this next part because what I did here was ultimately unsuccessful but there is a known issue with these drives that involves an internal micro switch that's meant to be operated by a metal post and often that post isn't pressing against it hard enough to make the contact. So the standard fix is to put some heat shrink tubing over the post to give it a bit more thickness and therefore operate the switch. There are plenty of other videos on YouTube showing this process so I won't go into it here, but while I had the drive opened up I sprayed contact cleaner in all the micro switches and tested for continuity, but I didn't find any other issues. We'll pick the video back up when I've put the drive back together and I'm about to test it for the first time following my attempted repair. Right, so I'm going to plug it in. We have exactly the same issue. Let's try putting a disc in. The power button's unresponsive. Well, it isn't these gears that are moving, it's just this right head. For some reason that motor is powering up when it shouldn't be. So it's definitely this Mitsumi motor that's running when it's powered on and that's responsible for moving the laser back and forward. So I assume that's going to be a 12 volt motor so if I inject some voltage into it see whether I can get it to 
move the sled back and forth. That may give us some answers. So I've got the bench supply on, about 11 and a half volts. 11 might be too much. Let's drop that down to about eight. It just looks as though it's not engaging with this worm gear here. So if I switch the polarity, it should go in the other direction. So maybe it's just slipped off this cog. Because if I remove this plate, it will show me why it's not engaging. It's really hard to see, but I think there's a nylon gear on the underside of here. And it may be that that's worn, and that's why it's not moving up and down. I can't see because there's a plate on the other side that's blocking my view. I can't even force it. Because it must have to come back this far to engage this micro switch. But there it just... It's not engaging with those teeth at all. So this mechanism may be toast, but will the mechanism from the other machine work in its place? So this is the working mechanism from my old machine. And I'm now a lot less confident that it will be interchangeable. The screw holes line up. And these cables seem to be the same size. So let's see if it accepts a disc. Well, it has read the disc and you can probably just about make out there that it says blank disc. But that display is so dim. I mean, the display on the other one was pretty bad, but it wasn't as bad as this. But at least it's read in the disc. So we know we're guaranteed at least a working model. The question is, can I switch out the transformer so that I can use the other device with a better display? Let's just check that it ejects okay. It does. To remove this transformer, I would have to get to the underside of this main board, but it doesn't look too difficult to remove. We've got a cable in the front here and some screws to remove in the back. A couple of screws in the board itself. A couple of plastic standoffs and a couple of screws either side of the transformer. I just need to disconnect this power cord. I missed a screw in the back. It looks like the only thing holding it in now is this plastic post at the bottom. I should be able to grip that and push it through. Here we go. So some fairly hefty solder joints keeping the transformer in place. But I don't think that'll be too much of a problem. So this is where you want a proper desoldering tool. But I'm going to have to make do with this and some solder braid. Is this leaded solder? It's melting nicely. That's the majority of it off. My little sucker did itself proud. So I'll get the rest up with the solder braid. Oh, we're free on one side. And we're out. So I'm going to mark this one as the 240 volt. So just clean up the pads ready to receive the transformer from the other board when I remove that. I mean, it is possible I'm being naive and assuming that you can just swap the transformer and everything will be fine. Maybe these other components have been chosen specifically for the voltage rating of the transformer. I don't know. I'm just hoping that's not the case. Well, you don't need to see me remove the transformer from the other board, so I will do that off camera and return when it's ready to solder in place. So we now have the original board from my 510 machine and the 120 transformer from the 320 machine. So hopefully it should slot in. I think it goes around this way. And yep, all the pins line up. Probably the most solder I've ever used at one time. So I'll just give that a good clean and we can get it all reconnected.
And I think with that, we should be ready to test. So I'm going to plug it in now. Well, nothing's gone bang. We have a red light. And we appear to have life. The display is better than the other one, but it's still pretty bad. So I might see if I can do anything with that. In the meantime, let's slap in a disc. Will it read it? Yes, it will. I'll just plug in the headphones since this model has a headphone jack. And yeah, that is playing fine. And if I press the record button, I don't have a source hooked up to it, but it does look as though it's ready to record a new track. But what can I do about that display? Well, the display board is all housed within the front panel, so if I can get that off, then it should be fairly simple to disassemble. Looks like there are screws in the bottom, three of those. And we can just disconnect these earthing clips. And then this flat flex. So there's actually two boards in the front with this linkage in the middle. I think I'm going to have to remove both of them though. I probably could disconnect that, but I'm not going to risk it. I think it's just the knobs holding this in now. Oops. Okay, finally. Inside of this window is very grubby, so that's not helping. Well, here's our display board, and we've only got the one capacitor. So I guess it's that one or nothing. I'm going to take it out and test it out of circuit. So that is 330 microfarad at 6.3 volts. I'm not going to have one as stubby as that, but maybe it can lie flat. Well, let's test it first. 294 ESR of 0.94. That's probably not too bad, so maybe it's not that. Let's see if I've got one anyway. Well, I've got a 330 that's 25 volts, but that should be fine. It's going to stand the legs off a bit, so I've got room to bend it over. I doubt this is going to make a difference. I'll just lay that down a bit more flat. Wondering whether that will go in the case. It might foul the power button. Well, surprisingly, it seems to go in there. I'm not going to put all the screws back in yet, just in case it doesn't work. So I don't need to be too fussy with this. I'm just going to reconnect this cable. That's the only one. Just plug this in, see if there's any improvement. No. Doesn't look like it. Mm, no, that looks just the same as it did before. I thought I'd do a quick comparison of both the display boards. And as you'd expect, they're very similar. The displays themselves appear to be identical. All the markings are the same. And all these resistors are measuring similar values. So I don't think there's any value in swapping out components. I do think it's probably worth running some voltage through the heater wires of this bad display to see if it responds at all. And if it does, then it might be worth doing it on the better display as well. But if it makes no difference to this one, then I probably won't bother doing it to the good one. So it looks like the heater wires are the first three pins on either end. So I'll desolder those and then inject some voltage. I don't think it's really possible to bend these pins off the board but I'm fairly sure they're no longer making contact with the pads, so that's going to have to be good enough. I'm just turning up my supply. You can see the wires glowing. That's 9 volts. Just leave that for a few seconds and drop it down. Then I'll do that again twice more. Okay, so I'll resolder those pins and then I'll hook it up again to the good machine. Okay, I've temporarily connected it up. 
taking care not to short anything against the case. So I'm going to plug it in now. All right, let's turn it on. It's actually hard to tell whether that's an improvement or not, but I think it might be. Of course, normally it would be behind the lens, so I'm just going to put the lens in front of it. I don't know, maybe I'm imagining it, but I think that might be slightly better. In fact, since it doesn't matter if this display dies, I might really over crank it, like do it again, but put the voltage up much higher. Okay, I'm hooked up again. I can turn on the supply and let's go crazy. Okay, so once again, we're temporarily hooked up. Wow. I think that's a significant improvement. Of course, this was coming from a base level that was much lower than the, the better display. I'm actually tempted to push it even further. Crank it up to 20 volts, maybe? It's quite fun doing this when you know it doesn't matter if it goes wrong. Okay, let's try 20. And plug it in again. Okay, that is definitely worse. So I think that third pass actually killed it. Okay, well that's good. It's, it's good to know that you can't push it too far. So given that the other display was already better than this one at baseline, maybe 12 volts would be the sweet spot? Because 20 is clearly too much. So I think I'm gonna try 12. This was good, this was good information, good data. All right, so let's go for 12 and hope for the best. That's all I'm gonna do. If it's no better, I'm just gonna accept it. Okay, so this is the good display in the good machine. This is how it's gonna be. Ooh. Wow, that is... That is great. Let's put the lens in front. That's actually better than I expected and more than I could have hoped for, really. I'm really pleased with that. I don't know whether that will last, but that is clearly a significant improvement. So here we are all back together, and I'm very happy because I've now got a mini disc recorder that works natively on 120 volts and also has a reasonable display. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.